welcome to another episode of Hollywood Kitchen. This is something very special that I'm very excited about. We are doing a summer reading episode, and I am so fortunate to know these two brilliant women who have both written debut novels this summer that have been published, and both of them are heavily inspired by Hollywood's golden age. So we're going to talk about their writing, their books, their process, and the stars and movies that inspired them. So I am so thrilled to welcome Liz Locke of Cinema Sips and author of the book Follow the Sun, and Maureen Lee Lenker. She is a journalist for Entertainment Weekly and also author of her debut novel, It Happened One Fight. So ladies, welcome to Hollywood Kitchen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. So, oh my gosh, I have so many questions for both of you and uh, I just cannot wait to get started. Um, first off, uh, ah, so many questions. All right. So I'll start with uh, Liz and Marina. We'll go back and forth. Mm -hmm. How, what inspired your novel? Like, what was the thing that clicked for you? Like, this is the story. This is what I'm going to write about. Mm -hmm. I mean, for me, it was heavily inspired by the photographer Slim Aarons, um, he photographed the 1960s jet set, and I've always loved those photos so much. And there are so many films that look like a Slim Aaron's photo, like Two for the Road and Charade, um, Goodbye Columbus. So there was like, I saw shades of Slim Aaron's in so many classic films, and I just loved being immersed in that world. So I think for me, like I wanted to take the like my favorite photos and sort of figure out what is the story behind them um, and just do research on the jet set and the stars of the time period and the people in that world. Um, and yeah, it was, that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've done articles about this very topic, but what, when was the moment where you're like, this is what I'm going to write about? Um, you know, it's kind of funny. It's actually a more modern uh, inciting incident. I mean, I've always loved classic Hollywood and films of the 30s and screwball comedies like It Happened One Night and Bringing Up Baby and all that sort of thing. Um, and so I kind of always wanted to write something in the space, but was never really sure what. And then I did an interview with Keanu Reeves and Winona Ryder, where uh, Winona Ryder said she thought that she and Keanu got married for real on set of Dracula because they had a real Romanian priest and they did like the full ceremony and vows and everything. Um, and that in and of itself was a great story um, and a, a like really exciting uh, anecdote for me as a journalist. But then it got me thinking like, well, what if that really happened? And what if it happened to a two people who didn't like each other because that's more interesting narratively and also to to some to two classic movie stars when it was a lot harder to get a divorce or or find your way out of something like that and then I think the moment that really clinched it was actually seeing Merrily We Go to Hell at one of the TCM film festivals and Carrie Beecham introduced it and started explaining how Neil Dodd the minister in the film was a real minister and I was like oh okay well then he's the minister in the book and there we go <laughs> Very cool. And I noticed both of your books, of course, have women that seem to be on kind of a journey of self-discovery. So how much of that was inspired by the stars and how much of it was inspired by your own lives? I love that both of these are female driven books, again, written by women who go through a lot of a lot of change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I was more inspired by classic film stars like Joan Crawford and Betty Davis, who were really unapologetic in the ways that they pursued their careers and put their careers ahead of basically everything else in their lives. And I really wanted to unpack what would make a person like that, what it was like to be a woman in the 1930s, where that was your goal and ambition. And also because both of them had very complicated love lives, like sort of how does that impact uh, romance when you are putting this ahead of all else? And what do you need to learn about yourself to maybe take a step back from that? 
Um, and I'm also really passionate about writing quote unquote unlikable female heroines because I think we should have complex characters who are as rich and uh, dynamic as male characters. And it was something that frankly that I think Hollywood did better in the 30s and 40s than they often do now. I agree. Um, and I think maybe it was more an unintentional journey of self-discovery of finding my own sort of uh, acceptance of my ambition and uh, dedication to my career and, you know, what that would look like feeling unapologetic about it. I feel like it's less inspired and more like I learned from Joan in writing her and creating her. Liz, how about you? Um, yeah, I think, um, well, for my main character, she wants to be a singer songwriter um, in the 1960s. And I think, yeah, for me, like how, my way into this character was like, she doesn't feel like she's good enough. Like that's my permanent, like, you know, thing that I always have to overcome in my own life is just, is that feeling. Um, or and or that she's not allowed to want this because that you know during that time period like for a woman in a wealthy family like she was expected to just marry well and that's all that was expected of her and so like to have this other goal that is so far out of you know people in her social sphere um that like that was really interesting to me um to kind of go on that journey with her and having her find her confidence and like how she finds her confidence. Like, I think that's sort of where I brought some of my own, you know, life into it, um, you know, because she finds it through her romance and her partner is very supportive of her. And I'm lucky that I have that too in my own life. And I think like, you know, when I was ready to give up and just say like, this is never gonna happen for me. It's not like, I'm just, it's, you know, I'm not meant to do this, like, it's just, I should find something else. Um, my husband was like, no, you're good at this. You need to keep going. So um, that was sort of like my parallel with the main character. But I did um, want to bring in more of the Hollywood um, ambition through a side character of the main character's best friend, Daphne. Like she's sort of my way into the 1960s film scene like they say like she's got a small part in the movie blow up but she's just you know looked at as this kind of dress up doll you know is beautiful you know accessory in the movies and she wants to make something really real and have more meaning in her career so you know that was sort of a fun aspect to dive into in like looking at the films of that time period and where would that character fit in okay excellent and i want to talk about the food i always like to do the food earlier in the show <laughs> i won't be cooking today but you guys have made things so um we talked about making a recipe that was either inspired or could fit in the world of your book or from a star that is inspired by that inspired your book so Liz, you made a Mai Tai and you made Elizabeth Taylor's rope yes. for Please do. So I'm actually, I'm gonna make the Mai Tai on camera. You know, I like to do this on Hollywood Kitchen. Um, yes, so as you're part of my awesome. book promo, a friend of mine designed these really cute bookmarks with cocktails from the book. Um, so this, the one that I'm doing is, today is the Mai Tai, and this is the last cocktail in the book. Um, it ends at the Royal Hawaiian Hotel in Honolulu, and that's my, like, everyone always asks me, of all the locations in the book, where would you most want to go? That's the place. Um, and I've been there. I loved it. I had a great Mai Tai by the pool, um, so it's just a really good memory. So, and I feel like people get a little intimidated by tiki cocktails, but this is actually a really easy one to make, I think. Um, so I have a bottle of this white rum that I, it's actually from Kauai and I've been to the distillery there, Kaloa rum. Um, so I try and use like ingredients that are a bit, you know, tied to the theme that I'm doing. Um, so let's see. So I've got Hawaii. Um, I've got 
Paul is Texas orange because the love interest in this book is from Texas and his nickname is Tex. Um, and I think this is a really great liqueur um, substitute for Contro. It's a little cheaper, but honestly, like in a margarita or a Mai Tai, I can't tell the difference. <laughs> so, um, let's see, and then I've got lime juice and a little bit of orgiate syrup pour that in okay and then we shake it up my favorite part <laughs> <laughs> okay and then i've got the <laughs> I've got this TWA uh, hotel glass that Maureen sent me on her, her recent trip there. I am dying to go to this hotel someday. So I loved getting just a little piece of it here. Um, and then I like to, some places don't do this, some do. I like to float a little dark rum over the top. Um, I just think it adds for a little, like a prettier color and a little more complex flavor. So, and then I garnish with a little pineapple spear and that's it, a Mai Tai. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I mean, every time I see someone with a cocktail shaker, I always think about the Chaplin uh, gag where he, he shakes his body. <laughs> <laughs> And then for my um, food item, I like, I live in Texas. It is 1000 degrees here all summer. <laughs> so I did not want to turn my oven on. Um, I picked up a copy of Elizabeth Taylor's 1980s diet book. Um, it's pretty old fashioned in terms of weight loss tips, um, I will say, but it actually like it's kind of a fun autobiography of hers. Um, she does give a lot of insights into her career and her relationships and kind of what like the struggles that she had with body image and how Hollywood treated her and the press treated her. Um, and so I kind of feel like this book was sort of her way of taking back control of that narrative and taking control over something that maybe she didn't feel like she had control of through most of her life. Um, so I made her a lot of the recipes are quite fancy. I mean, we're talking <laughs> caviar, lobster, souffles, <laughs> things that I'm not going to tackle. Um, but she had this recipe for a Roquefort cheese dip, which was actually really good. It's um, like fat free Greek yogurt, um, Roquefort cheese, a little bals balsamic vinegar, I think some ground mustard. Um, she said artificial sweetener. I would say almost every recipe in this book has artificial sweetener in it. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know if it was a 1980s thing or what, but I thought it turned out really nice. Um, it's got a good flavor. You have to like blue cheese, though. If you don't, <laughs> this is not the recipe for you. But, um, you know, I think this one's a winner. I could see sitting down with this in a cocktail and watching it, one of her films and enjoying it. So very cool. Oh, and I picked Elizabeth Taylor because she is one of the stars that flits through the world of Follow the Sun. Um, so I was saying that part of the inspiration for the book was the photographer Slim Aarons. Well, Elizabeth Taylor had a person, her personal photographer, Gianni Busacci, who followed her and Richard Burton through the height of their popularity. And he, I read his autobiography published by University of Kentucky Press. And it was fascinating. And he talked about going with her to the Las Brisas Hotel in Acapulco, where the, my book opens. Go, like they had a chalet in in Stad, Switzerland, that he would go. And he talked about his camera lens freezing on the mountain. Um, so it's she was such a part of this 1960s jet set world that of all the stars, like I really wanted to feature her today because um, I just I love her and I think she just like mentioning her in the book adds such a flavor to the story. I think. <laughs> 
I live five minutes from Forest Lawn Cemetery and one of my close friends lives five minutes from me and we joke about it, but anytime we have a big crisis in our lives, we actually drive up together to Forest Lawn and we sit and we talk to Liz. Oh, I love that. Cases when it's really worth it. We don't do it <laughs> But we're like, Liz can, un- she can't understand any money problems, of course. <laughs> Men problems, work problems, diet issues. Like Liz understands. Totally. Yeah. So we could treat Liz as this guiding light. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Mine is Doris Day. She is my spirit animal, but I would say like my number two is Liz. And I think they have a lot of similarities. It's interesting that like Hollywood did not like treated them as polar opposites, like the angel and the devil, but Honestly, like deep down, I think these two women were super strong and overcame so much in their lives. And I think they are both amazing role models. I agree. <laughs> now, Maureen, I had um, fun with your book me too, because like I'm kind of obsessed with Joan Crawford. I love her very much. And this is so heavily influenced by her. And like every say that, yep, I can see Possessed in that from 1931. Oh my God, that was Strange Cargo from 1940. And okay, that was um, Love on the Run from 1936. Like as a Joan fanatic, I could definitely spot the Joni in the book. And you have made Joan's Fruit Appetizer and also Clark Gable's Sour Cream Chocolate Cake. Yes. So I actually misunderstood the assignment and thought we were going to make everything on camera. So I have all my ingredients here. So yes, um, I'll give a little introduction first and say that, um, as you said, the my Joan, Joan Davis combining Betty and Joan <laughs> is very heavily inspired by Joan Crawford, particularly a lot of her backstory and um, just sort of her desire to sort of be loved by her public above all else and um dash howard my hero is very heavily inspired by clark gable although um probably a lot less misogynistic at the end of the day (laughs) um and so you so wonderfully shared uh some historical recipes with me both um jones fruit cup uh that was an appetizer that she liked to make and uh, Clark Gable's chocolate cake. So I'm gonna start by just making a pot of mint tea because um, the recipe for Joan's uh, fruit cup involves um, having mint ice, which suggested making mint tea and then putting it in the freezer. So um, I have some wonderful mint tea up in here. And um, the reason, uh, part of the reason why I chose this, besides uh, it being a, a little bit of a simpler take than the cake, um, is that uh, Joan's drink of choice in my book, my Joan, is a gin stinger. And um, as most people probably know, a key ingredient in a stinger is creme de menthe. And so the fact that this was a very mint forward uh, recipe was a big part of why I chose it for today. Um, And in terms of the chocolate cake, it was mostly the Clark Gable connection, but also I have a sweet tooth um, and Dash definitely has a sweet tooth as well. So I thought it would be fun to tackle that, but I'm gonna get this going um, and you can keep asking questions. (laughs) And I will obviously post finished versions when we're done. (laughs) Well, we have, I do every year, um, Liz was on it this past year, I do an Oscar cook-along and I get a told crack team of classic film fanatics and we all make a recipe uh, that's tied to either an Oscar nominee, an Oscar winner, or someone that should have won one and did not. And um, one year, Christina Rice, who is my Anne Dvorak biographer friend and Jane Russell biographer, she, um, her daughter is named Gable. And one year on the Hollywood Kitchen cook-along, they made the Clark Gable sour cream chocolate cake. And her daughter named Gable likes it so much that she requests that cake for her birthday. Oh, that's so sweet. I know, but a kid requests a cake. I don't think of no. (laughs) I do think a sour cream chocolate cake is really underrated in terms of uh, uh, how like moist and delicious it is. 
And my mom, my favorite chocolate cake is a chocolate amaretto cake that my mom makes me every year for my birthday. And it also has sour cream in it. So I was instantly drawn to that when I saw the recipe because yep. it definitely makes a difference when you're making a chocolate cake and there actually aren't that many recipes with it in it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of the Gable recipes I found in my research, they're all beef. Like one of them is called the hunter's breakfast. <laughs> like four different kinds of beef and I'm like, like oh geez checks out like with I, and that was something I really wanted to explore with Dash in the book was he has this hyper masculine public image and that's not necessarily who he is at home but it's something he's wrestling with uh performing for his public and how much of his true self he can reveal to the press and to the public and to Joan as well so it definitely, um, I thought 1030 was a little early for uh, a hunter's smorgasbord, but it certainly uh, makes sense with Dash and the ties between him and Clark as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, there's some recipes I've come across in my research, like I did Lon Chaney's potato biscuit, and granted that did not work out well for me at all, but like <laughs> even though he probably didn't cook, I could see Lon Chaney making and or eating a potato biscuit. But then there's the <laughs> Betty Davis East Indian curry. And I'm like, now that's not checked. The New England bean recipe checks, but the East Indian curry <laughs> does not seem to check. Like, it's kind of funny how you can go, hmm, mm -hmm. some of these work and some of these just don't. <laughs> well, I liked you. I was looking back on some of your older episodes and I saw that you did Dolores Del Rio's enchiladas, I think. Um, and those I kind of want to try. So she's one of the stars in that's mentioned in the book, like they go, the characters go to her villa in Acapulco for a party. And she was photographed by Slim Aaron's. And it's a really iconic photo of her like laying in a pool and she's in the water and her hair is kind of flowing out around her and she's got this hibiscus flower in her in her hair. And um, so I wanted, I definitely like wanted to bring her into the book, but I was, so when I was looking through stars, I'm like, oh, Dolores Del Rio would be a good one. And I saw you made her enchiladas. Did you like them? It turned out pretty well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, some of these recipes are such a roll of the dice in terms yeah. of, how <laughs> but those were actually good. And one thing I thought about doing at some point, I have so many ideas, but I thought about doing a Hollywood Kitchen Fiesta episode because I have like um, a Lupi Velez recipe, a Dolores Del Rio recipe. I have Ramon Navarro's Spanish rice. Mm -hmm. I have like at least a dozen guacamole recipes. <laughs> That's a great idea. <laughs> to kind of do a little fiesta or fun to do a little fiesta of all these different recipes that you know. Well, I am down for being a guest on that and making a margarita because Rita Hayworth, like it's rumored that margaritas were named after her. So. <laughs> and also uh, one of my favorite restaurants in Los Angeles is El Chilo. And that was a big star hangout as well. And they're very famous for their margarita, which is a secret recipe. And both Robert Redford and Jack Nicholson are connoisseurs of that. So that would go very well. With yes. <laughs> and I think this year marks the 100th anniversary of El it Chilo. It does. Yeah, they're actually offering a hundred dollar margarita oh with God. very special tequila <laughs> right now. Um, that's a little outside my budget, but <laughs> for a hundred bucks, that margarita better do a lot more than taste good. It better like yeah. I know. <laughs> is it a fountain of youth, or what? What? What does it have to offer besides just being a really good margarita? <laughs> right. Right. Oh my gosh. I, I thought another idea has doing a series of Hollywood kitchen restaurant themed episodes like the Brown Derby, the mm. El Chapo, like that's, I'm working on all that too. So it's kind Harry, of- this uh, really great new book about LA restaurants just came out. I just checked it out of the library and I can't remember what the name of it is. But it's, it's is it by George Geary? What? Is it by George Geary? Maybe it's got Philippe's on the cover and it's a yellow cover. And it's great because it's like 50 iconic LA restaurants from the history, some of which are still open, many of which are not. 
and it has recipes for each restaurant. That's so. short theory. Um, he's a friend. He was recently on my Golden Girls Estelle Getty episode. He made all the original cheesecakes for the Golden Girls. Oh my God. Oh, I love that. <laughs> yeah, and he's a celebrity <laughs> chef and he goes like all over the globe doing these food tours. And every time he brings a tour group through Hollywood, he books my cemetery tour. So our paths like cross quite a bit. And, That's so great. Yeah, my mom checked it out from the library for me because she knows that I'm obsessed with Hollywood history and was like, oh, well, this looks like you. And I haven't been able to put it down. Sadly, she had to return it. So now I'm going to have to just buy a copy. <laughs> oh, definitely. Definitely. I'll have to get George and all of us together for something. That would be that would be so much fun. Um, I have another question for you guys while you're working on the food is that each of your books has a very one thing that I, I really thought was so great about both of them is you guys obviously did so much painstakingly detailed research on your eras in terms of what the manicures would have looked like, what the drinks <laughs> would have looked like, what the weather would have been like. Like describe that process of like really making sure those details had a fine point on them. Yeah, I think um, for me, it was like looking at, you know, nonfiction books, like the one I mentioned from Elizabeth Taylor's photographer. Um, there was another book called The International Nomads, which was kind of like a social register of the time. And like, so that was kind of fun to see, like, what were their names? What were their customs um, of the jet set? What kind of, where did they go? What were the places? Um, and I also looked to um, documentary films of the time period. I think I'm lucky that I was writing in the 1960s that there were so many like the documentary film scene was, you know, really coming around at that time. Um, so like Monterey Pop, um, Pennebacher's Monterey Pop, that was a really good resource for me. Um, and I think too, like nailing the language. And I think Maureen does an amazing job of this. Um, in her book, like nailing the kind of the slang of the time period and the phrases that people used um, without it being hokey, you know. Um, and I think that like looking at the classic films of that time period really helped get the language right. Um, and they, I know they did for me and it, they probably did for you as well, because I'm reading this and I'm like, oh, I can picture this 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 classic film star saying exactly this. Um, it just it all felt so real. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for me, definitely, you know, such a hard life. A big part of it was watching films of the era. <laughs> and, you know, my first real exposure to Reno as this divorced town was from the women and that wonderful on the, train on the train to Reno and then their experiences at the ranch with Marjorie Main. And um, I could just watch that whole segment of the movie like every day of my life. It's <laughs> probably my favorite segment. And I do have a little tribute to Jungle Red in the book at one point. <laughs> um, but I that was basically all I knew about it was that you could go there and that this was a thing people did. And so I ended up doing a lot of research on what that entailed, which was fascinating. And I used a variety of sources. I read this great book which was a novel from the 30s or 40s. I can't remember copyright date. I have it in my room. I can go grab it. Um, but it's called Temporary Address Reno. And it's a bunch of like sort of anthology stories all by the same author of different women in Reno and their experiences. And some of them are at a divorce ranch. Some of them are staying in town. Um, and it was written in the era with and used a lot of firsthand accounts. So even though it was fiction, I felt like it gave me a really good window into the very different experiences, different social strata we're having in Reno at this time and what there was to do, the sort of activities on offer while you waited out these six weeks. And then just also so many great resources online. Like I found this Fan, the Reno Historical Society has a really wonderful website um, where they maintain a lot of photographs and um, other aspects of their history. And they have a Life magazine from 1937 that has a woman kissing the courthouse pillars. And I learned all about that tradition. Mm -hmm. And they have postcards from the 30s and 40s that are cartoons of women throwing their wedding ring off the bridge into the Truckee River. Um, and so just really getting a glimpse of all of that through these this various 
swag that people would have collected while in <laughs> Reno um, really helped inform the book and some of the milestones or activities or things that my characters would be up to. Um, and then a lot of the Hollywood stuff itself came from the films or also I read Not the Girl Next Door by Charlotte Chandler um, for my Joan research. And I read, uh, I'm blanking on the name of it right now. I think it's called like Clark Gable, The King of Hollywood by Warren Carlyle uh, for Clark Gable. And a lot of just like anecdotes or short stories from that, from their lives inspired things in the book. For instance, the book opens with Dash playing a prank on Joan by putting a skunk in her dressing room. And this is something that Clark Gable actually did to play a prank on. Um, I think it was actually a group of executives, but um, oh my gosh, it was just so funny to me and something that I would never even think of being a prank now, like <laughs> that I felt like I had to include it because it was such a unique bit of Hollywood history. So a lot of stuff like that. I thought it was like, when I read it, I was like, is this something George Clooney did recently? <laughs> like, cause he's you know, known I, for playing pranks. I really found that a lot in Clark Gable, how much Clooney has modeled his stardom on Clark mm -hmm. Gable because <laughs> I think he, I think, you know, he's kind of our last vestige of this like old fashioned Hollywood movie star. Mm -hmm. And I think he, I, he took so much of that and particularly probably because his aunt was Rosemary Clooney. But um, it was very much like Clark loved pranks as much as George Clooney loves mm -hmm. pranks. You know, I could see them interchanging. Like I could see George Clooney being in Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Yeah. Oh, and oh I yeah. I could only see George Clooney or Clark playing the George Clooney part in Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And I could see Clooney playing the Gable part in tons of movies. Yeah, like, totally. Like totally in my brain flip the two and it makes perfect sense. Well, I've got a, a drawing that an artist did in my bathroom. Um, we tried to have like bathroom themed art. And I love that, uh, like in each in the bathroom. And um, I uh, love that part in Oh Brother where uh, Clooney's like, I'm a Dapper Dan man and he's always doing his hair. And so we found this drawing of Clooney in that movie with like doing his hair with a Dapper Dan. And so many people see that in our bathroom and they're like, is that Clark Gable? Because, I mean, it looks just like him. Um, and if you're like just looking at it from like a certain angle, you're like, I can't tell which one it is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have always loved Clooney. And yeah, he reminds me so much of Gable. They have a lot of... Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah, I, um, I loved... Um, you know, like reading Maureen's book and just seeing all of these like nods to classic films. And I think that's why I love reading books set in the, like in this Hollywood milieu. And, it's, you know, and it's not necessarily like, like I have read the historical fiction books where, you know, the they're writing a story about a real star and like this person, like, I think I read one where Clark Gable, like, was a character, like the main character. Um, and that's fine. Um, but I think I like I think I enjoy more where like somebody takes this world and spins it off into their own kind of story, but still uses the, you know, people of the time period to make that setting um, and to make it come alive. Did either of you spend time in the locations from your book? Did you go on a big trip to Acapulco or did you spend time in Reno Marine or? <laughs> I oh, wish. <laughs> such a bummer. I had plans to go to Reno um, because I really did want sort of that firsthand knowledge and um, it was the year that there were terrible wildfires in Tahoe and the surrounding area. So I ended up having to cancel my trip because um, it was too dangerous and smoky to go. Um, and I was on deadline, so I couldn't sort of retroactively go. <laughs> um, but I, I've been to Tahoe a lot before, so I know kind of the area. Um, I've done a lot of studio tours and um, things of that nature. So of course have been um, of the places that are still existing, have been a lot of the places in LA that I write about. Um, I sort of imagined 
Evitz Studios, which is my fictional uh, studio in the book, as like a cross between Paramount and MGM. Like locationally, it's where Paramount is and has like a very similar layout. But then I imagine sort of the stars and the reputation more of like an MGM vein. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I still would love to go to Reno sometime because I do know like the sign that says the biggest little city in the world and the courthouse and the Hotel Riverside are all still there. Um, so I would love to get to see them up close and personal. I did actually just take a research trip yesterday because this is currently a three book series and I'm in the midst of drafting book three. So I went to the Adamson house in Malibu yesterday because um, Flynn Banks is the hero of book three and he lives in Malibu. And I'm excited for that book. <laughs> in the colony. So I wanted to go um, to a house that was built in the 30s there and really get a feel for what it would have been like in a much more uh, remote time for that part of our California coast. Well, that's another question that it leads me into because I find that like when you do a book, the minute it comes out, people are like, oh, so what's your next one? And I told someone once, I go, that's like asking someone in labor when you have in that next child. I would tell people, <laughs> I've just done two photo caption books, but I would tell people, don't ask me that. Like, don't ask, like, do you get asked that a lot? And like, what do you say when you are? I do. Um, Cause I think like, it took me like 10 years to get this one published and you know, and people naturally like, oh, are you writing something else in the 1960s? And I'm like, no, because it took so long for this one to get published. Like, why would I have written another one when I didn't think this one would be published? So no, like my next one is contemporary. Um, but even then, like, I, I don't have a multi book contract. So, you know, we've sent it out um, as of like two weeks ago. But like, I don't know if it's going to be published or not. Um, so I kind of just write what I'm into at the time. Like my books are always going to be about a woman's journey and like finding her place in the world. Um, Cause I feel like I'm on that journey <laughs> and it's yeah, something that I, I know about and I can write that with some authority. Um, and they're always going to have some sort of pop culture element and movie element because I love that. And I just, I like writing about it. Um, so even though like my next one is contemporary, like it's about a Hollywood screenwriter, there's a lot of, you know, classic film references in it still. Um, but yeah, like I, it's not, I love that people ask cause it means they're excited about, you know, what I'm doing next. But I mean, I always just say like, we'll see about the books, but you can always find me on Cinema Sips. Like that's something that I'm never gonna give up on. I love doing that blog every week. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, it's cool that people care, but then it's just so, it's, it's just an overwhelming prospect. Uh, when I did my little photo caption books, I kind of find found that promoting them was harder than writing them. Mm -hmm. Because when you write, you're like in your head and you're in this little bubble. But then when you have to go out into the world and convince a world that's rocked by pandemics and terrible news and all these crazy things going on in the world, you have to be like, oh, by the way, there's this thing you need to read. And you just feel like it's like an uphill battle to get interest in it. And it's very hard. I kind of found that to be a big challenge. Yeah, I am. Um, I, I just like, I don't love the in person events. I was super excited for this today because I knew I could just be in my kitchen and talk to people that I really enjoy talking to. And it's low pressure, low stakes. Um, but yeah, the in person events um, terrify me. <laughs> I don't, I don't love to be on a stage with the microphone or anything. Um, but I feel like, you know, I put so much effort into writing this and getting it published that I have to end this journey knowing that I did everything I could to sell this. And if that includes in-person events and Instagram giveaways and, you know, whatever, um, I just like I want to be able to tell myself, like, I did everything I could. But yeah, I don't love the promo part of this. <laughs> 
you with Hollywood Kitchen because I know so many people who've written books. I feel like if there's any little thing I can do to help spread the word, why not? I mean, you know, so, it's so appreciated. <laughs> sure. And so too, I'm kind of optimistic. Oh, go ahead, Carrie. I always encourage people to buy at your local brick and mortar bookstore yes. if you can, because I try to put my money where my mouth is and go to Larry Edmonds in Hollywood. If they don't have it, I'll go to Skylight. If they don't have it, I'll go to Chevalier's. I try so hard to support those stores because I don't want to live in a world where bookstores don't exist. Mm -hmm. So do you guys have a favorite local bookstore that I know you do, Maureen, here in L.A., uh, where you can buy the book and it's very you know, supportive of a small business? Yeah, I am uh, in Austin. Well, it's actually like a little bit north of Austin in, in Georgetown, Texas. Lark and Owl is such a fantastic store. Um, it's where I had my launch party because I feel like they really support women's fiction and romance to a level that I don't see in a lot of other stores. Um, I also love book people in Austin, like in the city proper. Um, it's just a fantastic independent bookseller. But Lark and Owl, like they have my heart forever. Um, and I just, yeah, I want to send all the business I can their way because they're just so supportive of, of women authors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I actually had my launch party at the Ripped Bodice in Culver City, which is actually a stone's throw from the former MGM. Um, now, uh, now Sony. Um, and Amazon. <laughs> and uh, they're a romance bookstore. They were the first romance bookstore in North America. Um, so, and they're female owned, queer owned, like very um, inclusive space, very celebratory of um, female authors and their writing. And uh, I just love them. I've been a fan since they opened about six years ago and uh, was so happy to get to have my launch there. But there are so many wonderful bookstores in LA, as you said, Carrie. Um, I just introduced It Happened One Night at uh, the Los Feliz Three last weekend and then did a signing at Skylight Next Door, which is a wonderful bookstore. I love Larry Edmonds and whenever I'm in Hollywood, try to stop in there, have many lobby cards from them uh, around my apartment. And uh, in terms of the other questions you were asking, people do ask me about next books, but I was very lucky to get a three book deal when I sold this book and have pitches in mind for books two and three. That's very common in romance fiction. And okay. it's sort of, it's not a series in the sense of the story of the first book is going to continue. It's more, I like to think of it more as a cinematic universe <laughs> where, each book is going to tell a new story and have new main characters, but it's going to still be in the same world. And some of those characters will probably pop back up. And, um, uh, and you can read them as standalones. There's no need to read them all or read them in order. Although of course I would love it if you did that. But you could still follow the story and enjoy yourself if you were to read book two before book one. Um, it's just a little more rich if you've read the previous book and you know some of these characters that are popping back up or you've been waiting for a certain character to get their story. And in terms of the promo stuff, I have to admit, I'm a ham. I'm a, I grew up a theater kid. I love performing for a crowd and um, getting that audience response. So I actually really love the promo component of this. Like it's, uh, you, there's a, a line in my book about how when Joan first came to California, she would go to the beach and practice putting her hands and feet in the sand and signing her name. And that, that's something that came from me. Like I've done that at the beach since I was a kid pretending it was the Chinese theater. And I've been <laughs> practicing my autograph for years. So getting to finally sort of realize that dream through being an author has been really exciting and rewarding for me. And I hope just continues to grow. I was so honored to be able to join the American Cinema Tech last weekend and introduce a, a film print of a movie that heavily influenced my book. And it was a really, really fun day. 
Was it emotional the first time you held your book in your hands? Because when I, when Hollywood celebrates the holidays, my holiday book came out that with the day it arrived in my apartment, I opened up the box and I just screamed, it's a lie. <laughs> I felt like Frankenstein. I felt like standing on the roof of my apartment, holding the book up and just screaming, it's alive at the top of my lungs. <laughs> how did, how was that moment when you held that in your hand for the first and saw your name on the cover? Like how did that feel? It was like, for me, it was exciting, but it was also like, it was sad um, because it, it took so long for the book to happen. Like my dad passed away a couple of years ago and I would have really loved for him to have seen it. Um, so I think, and this is something that is also in the book, um, you know, because I was editing while going through all of this. Um, and so when the main character talks about like grieving her father who's passed away, um, that's me. Um, I put a lot of myself into that aspect of the character. And, you know, it's it's so exciting to see this thing that you've waited so long um, to, to have to like see in person. Um, but yeah, like thinking about the people that won't get to see it makes me a little sad too. Um, so I, I always want to tell people that are like, you know, they're writing romance and they're like, oh, I'm putting post-it notes over the parts that I don't want my parents to read or whatever. I'm like, I would kill for my parents to be able to read anything that I've written, a sex scene or not. Like I would, I would, you know, I, that would be amazing for me. It's like not going to happen. Um, but my mom, you know, read it. So that was ex exciting for me too. Like, I think I was more excited when it showed up on her doorstep than mine. Like she got to see this. <laughs> so. Yeah. And for me, I was just so excited. I mean, I got the first physical copy, which was an advanced copy. So not the final version um, in the middle of December. And so it felt like it was like my Christmas gift. Like I put the book <laughs> under my Christmas tree as soon as it came and just left it there for the all of the holidays. Cause it just was like, it felt like my Christmas gift to myself. Um, and I was so excited to take pictures with it and hold it. And then when the actual finished box of copies came, that was also very exciting. Um, my mom had always imagined the the final scene of Back to the Future where um, George McFly gets his box of finished copies just as Marty's figuring out what's happening in this now alternate future and he's opening it and he pulls it out my mom's like I want to have a moment just like Back to the Future and so she came over and was filming me and she, I had to wait to open the box till she could come and take a video um, and same as Liz like I think being able to share it with my family first and foremost was even more exciting than holding it myself. Like my book's dedicated to my mom. She's why I love books because she read to me so much as a child. So getting to like see her hold it was almost more exciting than holding it myself. And same thing with my grandma. She's like a huge reader and getting to see her with the book was really exciting. <laughs> Another question that I have for you guys is, the audiobook aspect, because did you have any say over who read audio versions of your book? Yeah, I had, um, I, I think they sent like five audition tapes over and I got to pick my favorite one. Um, and I will say like, I, first of all, I didn't know that I'd have that level of say so in this process, um, but I was, astounded that they like because I wrote lyrics for the songs in my book like the main character is a singer songwriter and I did my best with the lyrics but I'm not a musician by any means um so I just you know I looked at poetry I looked at songs of the time period and just tried to find the rhythm in them and put my own words in um, but th when they were talking about the audiobook, they were like, and we're going to find someone that can play guitar and ukulele and write music for the songs. And I'm just like, what? That's a thing. Like, I, I don't read a lot of audiobooks. Um, so I just didn't know that that was a thing that happened outside of like Daisy Jones and the sexes. <laughs> so, um, 
Anyway, so they sent over audition tapes with like reading and doing, there's a lot of accents in my book. Like it's a very international set of characters. So they like sent a sampling of accents. And then also these people had written music for the songs. And I just, I just sat at my desk and cried listening to them because it was just amazing to hear these words really come to life. Like, I just never imagined that I would hear them as a song. And um, so I I ended up choosing like the reader Victoria Carr that I thought had the best voice for the main character because it's told through her her voice, her perspective. Um, and then she also did open tuning like the main character did. So I knew that she would handle the songs really well. And oh my God, like I listened to the audio book, it came out a few weeks ago. And again, I'm just sobbing through them. Like I imagine it's what people who see their work adapted into the, like into a movie must feel like to see it come alive like that. I never imagined I would get that experience. And then she just did, the, I mean, I need a soundtrack album. I've been like saving the songs on my phone and like I can go back and listen, like I saved them as like a video kind of thing and I can go back and listen to them. And my husband was nice enough to like hook his phone up to the stereo system so we could hear them like on the nice speakers. And they're so good. It's like the lost Joni Mitchell album. I mean, I'm just blown away by what this, musician did and I'm just like how are you narrating audiobooks in somewhat obscurity and not winning Grammys like <laughs> she is an amazing musician so anyway that was my experience and it just could not have been better <laughs> and for me um, mine was very interesting in that uh I uh, was already social media friends with Patty Murin, who is a wonderful New York-based actress uh, who was the original Anna in Frozen on Broadway. She's actually played several Disney princesses in various productions. She was also Belle, who is my favorite Disney princess. Um, and so we were already uh, friends on Twitter. And when I first announced my book deal, uh, she immediately responded like, oh my God, I love classic Hollywood. I would love to be your audio narrator if you need one. Um, and so I, of course, was gave told her enthusiastically yes, but didn't really know what the process or the resources would be. But it did work out in the end that she got to be my narrator and I couldn't be happier. I think she has such a wonderful understanding of the period. She does the mid-Atlantic accents so well where that hint of the time is there, but it doesn't feel like it's overpowering your enjoyment of the story and the narration. And I think her voice for Harry, my studio boss, is my favorite. Like you can <laughs> hear the chewed cigar in her mouth as she <laughs> reads his voice. So um, yeah, I, I believe that in most cases I would have a s experience more like Liz's where I would get uh, samples of several narrators and choose the one I liked best. But in this case, I got to sort of have a bespoke situation because Patty was so excited about the book, which I'm so grateful for. Yeah, that's really cool because I, I love reading, of course, but I also do a lot of audiobooks just because it's LA, I'm in traffic a lot. Mm -hmm. Or if I'm doing a mundane task around the house, I kind of like to have something to, to listen to. And if I try a book and I can't deal with the narrator's voice, or I tried one film history audiobook once and they mispronounce so many names, I'm like, I'm <laughs> walking off and just gonna read the book, read the book, as opposed, you know what I mean? Because it can kind of, it can either make or break to me, you know? Mm -hmm. So it can, like, I'm gonna do Liz's audiobook now too, because I'm like, <laughs> oh, after she described all this, I'm like, oh, God, I have to do that as well, you know? So, <laughs> I have to admit, really, that I started listening to my audiobook just because I wanted to hear. And even though I wrote the book, I actually ended up listening to the whole thing because it really, like Liz said, it, it was akin to the experience of watching someone turn your book into a movie. It became mm -hmm. so this other thing that was a collaboration between you and the performance art of the narrator. And mm -hmm. it really felt like an out-of-body experience of listening to 
you know you wrote the book, but it still feels like you're listening just to a story and you're getting lost in it because the narration is so good. Totally. Yeah. I thought like I would not want to listen to this because it's cringy to hear your writing read back to you. I don't know. But like it was totally not that experience at all. It was like just magical and it felt like like I, I don't know. I felt like a little bit removed from the words as an author and I was just like really deeply invested in the story and that's magical <laughs> for any yeah, writer. It was, it was not an experience I anticipated having because I same as you Carrie I like to listen to audiobooks if I'm putting away laundry or stuck in traffic and um and so I'm used to what they sound like and I don't feel like listening to them generally feels like that different of an experience to me to reading mm. but when it's your own work it really is remarkably different <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely let me check my facebook on my phone and see if anyone's sending us some questions here anyone watching sometimes i like the interactive aspect of all this and uh, logging in and seeing what the viewers have to say <laughs> yeah well, I'm going to circle back. Speaking of this TWA glass, I'm circling back. I'm making a pledge right now in Hollywood Kitchen. If my next book sells, I'm booking a ticket to the TWA hotel. I'm not leaving JFK. I'm just going to go to the hotel. <laughs> I'm really sad, Liz, that we, we checked in very late. Our flight didn't land until like 11, and we checked out the next morning. And uh, Connie, the cocktail bar, which is... Um, actually a cocktail bar in the inside of a former TWA 737. Mm -hmm. um, we did not get to go there because it didn't open till three or four in the afternoon. And by the time we got there the night before it was closed. So you will have to go there and have a drink for me. <laughs> yeah, no, I definitely need like at least two nights at this place. <laughs> like... this my, friend, uh, my ax throwing friend, Javier, he, um, he used to do props for Mad Men and he wrote the show, TV show Bones. Or oh whatever. my God. He went to the TWA hotel and he loves vintage stuff like we do. He brought vintage clothes, vintage hard shell suitcases and lugged them all around. New I York. would. I have them. I am ready. <laughs> like, this makes total sense to me. <laughs> uh, it's not actually vintage, but a 60s inspired dress and made my boyfriend take pictures of me around the whole house. So. <laughs> Oh, luggage, those are like so easy to find at flea markets because I oh, have yeah. of them and I need to get like a whole big set with the hat box and the thing, which I don't know how it'll cost to fly the, all that luggage east. But yeah, oh. that's like I have like we, we got it from my stepfather's mother's house. It was like vintage Samsonite, I guess, but it's got like kind of a marbled cream exterior with like little gold handles on the top. And it, there's three different sizes. Um, so I always take one of like if we do a road trip around Austin, it's just like an overnight trip or one or two nights. I'll take one of those with me and put it just looks so cute going in the back of the car. Like <laughs> I love I vintage luggage. <laughs> really want some. I've wanted a steamer trunk for ages, but the problem is I would like the porter to go with the steamer. Trunk. <laughs> I don't want to carry it myself. <laughs> Plus the airlines, like the one time I traveled with my hardback suitcase, it's a real tiny one. And I took it on the plane, mm -hmm. with me. but I don't trust them to check a hard because I brought a friend of mine, an antique plate on my last trip home to Savannah last month. And I wrapped it really, really, really well in my suitcase. I get back to Los Angeles. I unpack the plate is completely broken in half. And I was like, no, no. I just don't think they hand, like they're careful when they handle this stuff. And I'm just afraid if I checked a vintage piece of Samsonite, I'd get to New York City and it'd be like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you for that. <laughs> the TWA hotel party is like one of my life bucket list goals at the point. <laughs> right there with you <laughs> yeah. you know it's like i i've always wanted to go on the tcm cruise and i feel like that would be the perfect place for a piece of luggage like that <laughs> yes oh definitely definitely my dad gave me this tip too when i was the one time i flew with it back home he's like roll up all your clothes really really tight and like a little roll and then you can get more of them in the hardback luggage and i was like thanks dad yeah so, <laughs> Very I brought one piece of time on this cake. 
how long do you think it should go in for like 20 minutes and then check it um I'd have to check the recipe or ask Christina uh Christina made it and I would have to see kind of what she said but it's it's so weird because oven temperatures vary and yeah I think I'll just do 20 and 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 keep an eye on it and see what happens (laughs) Cakes are a lot harder to make than I realized. Like the first time I really made one from scratch, I was like, wow, this is a lot harder than I thought it'd be. Thankfully, this is only uh, one layer, so. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I almost made, Elizabeth had a recipe for an orange souffle and you like hollow out the oranges and bake the souffle in the orange peel. But it didn't have clear like temperature or time instructions with this. And I was like, this could go south very quickly. (laughs) So I still might attempt it someday, but like not for Hollywood Kitchen. I don't know. (laughs) If it's good, maybe you need to do an Elizabeth Taylor episode. I'll let you know. (laughs) That is in the works. I do want to do that. My list is so long. It's almost endless of the number of star recipes, which is so fun. (laughs) Great. I love that. I don't really feel unless somebody nowadays becomes like a, you know, has a cookbook. I don't really feel like that's something we get anymore. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of stars that are what I would call kind of lifestyle gurus, but yeah, it's not, not like it used to be. I mean, Gloria Swanson was like an early lifestyle guru. Like there were early ones, <laughs> like that, you know, and uh, yeah, I just think a lot of these recipes were written to for like housewives who knew exactly what they were doing and that is so not me like I'm Mm. like I need very explicit detailed instructions or I'm going to screw up I know myself (laughs) yeah and I think a lot of modern people probably are that way because so many of us work and juggle multiple things and you Mm. know and I think we're used to recipes that are much more explicit in that way I mean I know I think you're right, Carrie. I think it's a function of who and when it was written for, because I have a lot of family recipes from my grandmother and, you know, there's lots of them that say, you know, add this till it looks right. I'm like, well, I ha- having not made it before, I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> My mom back home in Georgia makes stuff and I will watch her like a hawk and I will even make notes and then I'll come back here to LA and make it and it still doesn't taste right. And I'm like, what have I done? You know, it's so hard. Cooking is kind of a, a kind of form of magic in a lot of ways. I think that's why I like to stick to cocktails because I think there's like a basic ratio that you know with the cocktail, like here's the alcohol and then you mix the, like the sweet and the sour in ratios that equal the alcohol and you're good to go. And it's, I don't know, like once you've done it enough and maybe like two, like I've done it enough. So I'm maybe I'm one of those people that's like, well, you just know, like, <laughs> but, but no, I think there is like, there's a science to cocktails and it's quite easy and you don't have to deal with temperatures or anything. <laughs> so <laughs> there's not a ton of ingredients, like at most I would have four or five and And that's good. And that's that's about all I'm willing to do. Um, I don't do a lot of cooking. I do HelloFresh for the most part. (laughs) Um, But cocktails are where I shine, I feel. (laughs) Have you ever done one where they set it on fire? I have because, you know, I went to that, speaking of margaritas in LA, I went to that bar that does the like margaritas on fire in LA. El Compadre. Yes. And, um, and they put like the light, well, I don't, I don't remember how they did it, but I've had it before where it was like, they hollow out a lime and put the like lighter fluid, like the alcohol in and light it on fire. Um, so I've done that at home and my husband like made a, he's a ceramics artist. So he like made this volcano like cup for me (laughs) that I could put the lime in and light it on fire. But what I didn't think about, like I had a straw in there and I was like, oh no, the straw is melting. You know, it's, I just like, wasn't thinking ahead. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I, um, it's funny. I, maybe you've heard of this in, in Austin, Liz, because it gets hot down there. But I was just reading an article last week uh, about margarita burn. And I was like, oh, that has to be, you know, when you set your margarita on fire and you accidentally smash your face into it. And 
but no, it's actually the, if you get, uh, if you spill margarita on your skin, particularly the, the lime juice, it can have an interaction with the sun that can actually cause your skin to burn. So it was saying that, oh. you know, during summer months, beware of margarita burn. So, well, that's another reason to never leave the house, <laughs> so, which is what happens to me from June to October. <laughs> so. I love it. <laughs> so how's the cake coming along? Oh, it's great. It's got about 13 minutes and uh, the ice is still making, but all the other components of the fruit cup are coming along. I did mean to at least do the ice last night, but uh, somehow forgot <laughs> to do that in the, in the midst of everything going on. But uh, everything's ready to go for both of them when, when they are done doing their thing. <laughs> you'll, send me, you'll send me pictures I can post of the, the final result. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So we've, we've talked about both of your books and about the backstories and the films that inspired them. Um, for anybody that's maybe watching that also wants to be a writer, like, is there any advice that you would give to people? Hmm. Ooh, keep going. <laughs> that's, the best. that's the best. And make friends, um, you know, meet other writers and start sharing your work. Um, because I think that that's, where my story took a turn. Um, you know, like I said, it took me 10 years to get this book published. I've been on a long road, but it really accelerated once I started having other readers, um, other writers reading my work, critique partners. Um, that was huge. But a lot of it is keep going, believe in, believe in your work. And if this isn't the thing that's gonna sell, start something else. That's what I did. Like I, like I said, I did not think Follow the Sun was ever going to get published. So I wrote a whole other book in the interim. And I had just, I'd, I think I'd sent it to Maureen. I'd sent it to my agent. And then a week later, we get the offer for Follow the Sun. So you never know. But like, just keep keep working, keep working on something that you're excited about. Um, and I feel like that's also like what I've done with Cinema Sips. Like, 10 years is a long time. It's a long time while, like, to wait on publishing to say yes. Um, so if there's something that you can do to get your writing out there in the meantime and to build that community, do it. Um, you know, and it's brought, like Cinema Sips has brought me so much joy. It's brought me so many wonderful people into my life like you, Carrie and Maureen. Um, like I would, I probably wouldn't know either of you without this blog, you know, so it's just, um, yeah, find the thing that you love to do and do that. And the rest of it will fall into place eventually. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, patience is the key with publishing, <laughs> um, in so many ways. I mean, my first book took me five years to write. A lot of that was on my own. And then also going back and forth with some friends on revisions but it is when you're first starting and you don't have that agent or that editor it can feel very lonely and it's very easy to get lost because you feel like you're in a vacuum and you don't even know what you need to do to revise or improve the book you just know it needs something mm -hmm. um but I, you know I kept at it and then um my first book, which I signed my agent with, actually did not sell. So it happened one fight was actually the second full length novel that I wrote. So you just have to be prepared that like things are going to take as long as they're going to take. And sometimes like my first book took five years, but I got my agent off of it. So even if it didn't sell, it still served a really wonderful purpose in my life. And I learned a lot from doing it. And maybe someday it'll end up out there in the world. But even if it doesn't, it still got me a lot further in my journey than I was before. And so you have to be willing to frame it that way and take those wins as they come, even if they're not the ultimate destination that you're hoping for, for your writing or your book, they're still moving you along this road to reaching that destination. Totally. That is fantastic advice for both of you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and also, um, Anna Marine, you have a list in the back of your book, but if you want, for, for TCM fans or any film fans that are watching this today, if you had to rattle off like a handful of movies that are either inspired your book 
or complement your book, what would you tell people to watch? Um, so I did a little like I'm not a I'm not a real person on Instagram like R E E L like I do not understand how they're made. They take I me three so days to do it. I don't know, um, but I did like I did make a reel of the, of the movies um, and like that either inspired Follow the Sun or like ones that you would probably enjoy if you like this book. Um, I mentioned two for the road and charade two Stanley Donan classics. Um, I would say Blake Edwards, the party. Um, also, well, the Pink Panther movies a bit. Um, I think thematically before sunrise, um, the story of these two lovers meeting in a foreign country and you're not sure if they'll ever see each other again that was a big one um shampoo for the la scenes um yeah like there would i just feel like there's so many that like slim errands is lens touched um and i don't know if like people know this but the character jimmy stewart's character in rear window was inspired by slim errands and um, I think like that's another great movie to watch, like to get that sense of the photographer, like a magazine photographer of the time period. Um, but yeah, Goodbye Columbus. I just watched that last night, actually, because my husband was like, I don't really care what we like, just watch whatever you want tonight. I'm like, oh, Goodbye Columbus. That's my summer movie. And I feel like that movie in particular, like Ali McGraw jumping into the pool at the beginning of that movie, like that is 100% what I base the first scene and follow the sun on, like that sense of like this, you know, wealthy, beautiful woman jumping in the pool um, and you're wondering like, what is going on in her life like what is her story that's how i wanted to start this book um so yeah definitely goodbye columbus <laughs> yeah and for me well i've already mentioned to the women definitely um both for how it sort of deals with what it is to be a woman in 1939 and the reno divorce segment um, and Merrily We Go to Hell, which is um, a little earlier than my book is said it's a pre-code, but to, to see Neil Dodd, that real minister working in the day. Um, and then definitely it happened one night. Uh, there's a lot of direct references to that in the book, most particularly with um, the bed sheet between the bed and uh, the walls of Jericho and also uh, a sequence that's going in the movie that Joan and Dash are making involving um, forging a river and uh, Dash carrying Joan across the river. Um, let's see what else I mean any Clark Gable and Joan Crawford pairing you mentioned love on the run Carrie that's a great one. Um, but any of the films they made together, I think really captures the chemistry that I was feeling between Dash and Joan in writing this. Um, I would say any women's picture of the 30s or the 40s really captures the type of work that Joan is hungry for. But I was specifically thinking of like a dark victory or a Mildred Pierce, where someone like Betty or Joan like finally gets their chance to really sink their teeth into the kind of role they've been hungry for and ends up winning an Oscar because of it. Um, so those would be my primary ones, but honestly can't go wrong with any good screwball comedy. I, I wanted reading It Happened One Fight to feel like you were watching a screwball comedy from the 30s, except that it doesn't fade to black with during the <laughs> sex scene. Love it. That's my favorite part of your book. <laughs> I, was, well, I was reading it like, wow. <laughs> Yeah, if you uh if you've watched screwball comedies and wished that it didn't fade to black it happened one side is for you <laughs> uh, so uh, honestly can't go can't go wrong with any great classic screwball comedy that <laughs> the energy of that is very much the energy i came into this project with <laughs> So much fun chatting with you both. You Both of your books are fantastic. They are wonderful reads. I encourage everybody out there to pick these up and support your work. Support independent bookstores if you are able to do so. And thank you guys for joining me today. 
my gosh, my pleasure. Thank you, Carrie. Thanks for the recipes. I'm so excited to keep uh, investigating. You sent me a bunch of Joan Crawford recipes. Maybe I'll get brave someday and try the veal mousse, but <laughs> today is not that day. <laughs> Well, thank you again for having me back on the kitchen. Like, I love being here and I love chatting with two of my favorite film friends. So this was such a treat today. <laughs> do this again. So let's let's plan a rematch for sure. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. It was well, I, lovely speaking with you both. Yes. <laughs> so much. I do want to pay Patreon if anybody wants to support that, because I usually put the ingredient all the money towards ingredients and cookbooks and supplies and everything. And just thank you guys for being here today. Thank you everybody who's been watching and please stay tuned for more food fun and film history from Hollywood Kitchen. <laughs>